My name is Danny Forster, and this is Build It Bigger. I'm an architect, and I've spent years traveling the globe investigating incredible feats of architecture. And right now, I'm gonna take you behind the scenes, one of the largest construction projects in all of Asia. Singapore is reinventing itself. This small island nation is attempting to finish one of the most audacious buildings on the planet. It's the country's first casino, three skyscrapers Whoa. covering nine million square feet and topped off by an engineering masterpiece. The first ever sky park. Longer than three football fields with gardens, swimming pools, and restaurants all higher than the Seattle Space Needle. We're actually in the pool right now. We're in the pool. This is the view from the pool. Wow. It's pretty spectacular. That is amazing. To finish it, crews must perform some of the highest and heaviest lifts ever attempted. I mean, you're putting a piece of steelwork the size of a, an aircraft carrier on top of three towers. Tackle one of the largest paint jobs on the planet. You would never do this in America. And erect one of the longest cantilevers in the world. 200 feet out over nothing. Oh my God, that's enormous. I am in Singapore, a tiny island nation with less than 5 million residents. In fact, the entire country is smaller than all of New York City. Located at the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula in Southeast Asia, the main island of Singapore is both a city and a country, one of the most densely populated in the world. Culturally speaking, it's a somewhat strict and buttoned up environment. Chewing gum against the law. Insensitive behavior is punishable by fine. And if you're caught vandalizing a building, you quite literally get hit with a stick. But despite this conservative cultural backdrop, Singapore is attempting to reinvent its image by doing something totally surprising. They're gonna open a massive casino. With no natural resources of its own, Singapore is risking five and a half billion dollars in hopes of cashing in on the gambling boom exploding across Asia. It's a pretty significant gamble because for Singapore, you've never had gaming before at this scale. You've never had a resort at this scale. Yes. You're taking a kind of a major leap. Yes, it's certainly a transformational project for Singapore. Where you hope to actually not just double, but triple. triple. The tourism receipts. That's big. Mm -hmm. The centerpiece of this giant transformation, the Marina Bay Sands. One of the biggest and most expensive casino complexes in the world unlike any hotel and casino ever built. Rather than just being kind of a traditional hotel and casino that we might find in Vegas, instead, we have a museum, you have theaters, you have retail, you have a casino, massive convention center, three incredible hotels, and all of that capped by the first ever Sky Park. That is absolutely right. The Sky Park on the very top will become the icon of Singapore, we think. In a move that has never been done before, world-famous architect Moshe Softy put a park across the top of three massive skyscrapers. An 1,100-foot-long urban oasis with tropical gardens and one of the longest swimming pools on Earth. All of it perched 55 stories above the ground. So, Brendan, how do you describe a sky park to people? Uh, I mean, it's just a fantastic structure. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, there's three 55-story towers, and you're putting a piece of steelwork the size of a, an aircraft carrier on top of it. So it's quite a feat. And there's a park up there? There is. Well, there's more than that. There's observation decks and swimming pools and restaurants and all sorts of things. So it'll be a little city in itself. The biggest challenge for builders lifting 7,000 tons of steel, which is more than the main span of the Brooklyn Bridge, on top of three 650-foot-tall buildings. To get it up there, the team divided the structure into 14 large but more manageable segments. Six form the bridges connecting the towers, and the other eight make up the observation deck, which sticks out 218 feet from the end. 
And right now, crews are about to lift the second to last bridge segment, a massive 350 ton piece that will hang between towers two and three. It's a little after 7 p.m. and on most job sites, it'd be quitting time, right? Folks would be going home. But here in Singapore, we're about to begin one of the most critical lifts in the entire project. That bridge segment right there, an over 356 ton chunk of steel is about to get lifted up over 650 feet in the air. I mean, you know, in principle, this sounds crazy, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, we're actually taking a bridge, lifting it up and putting it on top of two skyscrapers. Yes. This has never been done. Never done. So, I mean, you gotta be a little bit nervous to get this thing up. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> we have to get it right. Lifting this piece will take some of the strongest hoisting cables ever designed. Going up. All right, Solomon, up here? Yep. They get attached to the very top of the segment, five stories up. All right, and now, at long last, I'm on the top of the whole bridge segment, and you really, you really get a sense of its length, because look at that. It spans all the way out between two full towers over 150 feet long. And here, this is what it's all about. This is the shackle coming down over 600 feet up. And to really get that point, come here, check this out. Look at the amount of bound cables inside of this thing, just the density. It's two of these shackles, one on this side, one on that side. We're gonna lift up over 350 tons of steel. All right, you call the man upstairs. An operator from the top of the sky park lowers the shackle down. There she comes, there it is, here it is. It has to line up within a tenth of an inch for this 150 pound anchor pin to fit through. Oh no. Stuck. Push. Five, come on, shake it a little bit. Hammer. Give it to me, Poppy. Oh, yeah. You ready? Here I come. Once the pins are pounded into place and the shackles are connected, there is one final step to make sure that the load is secure. Woo! Overnight, crews test the connections for 12 hours by hanging the segment just four inches above the support. If everything looks good, it is ready to go up. Okay, Solomon, she's floating. Yes. Four inches off the ground. Ready for the lift? Yes. How's the wind? If you can see it, it is swinging. And if it swings, it might hit the building. So when the lift begins, the concern is in a strong wind, like yeah. a pendulum, yes. it could move and actually hit the building. Uh, yes. Is that close to the building? It is very close to the building. Because of the curvature of the towers, this piece must pass within 10 feet of two glass skyscrapers on its way up. Any wind over five miles per hour is enough to call off the lift. So are we good? Are we ready? Yeah, yeah good. So it's yeah. now okay to go. Okay, okay, I'm ready. Typically, crews would use tower cranes for heavy lifts, but this segment far exceeds their capacity. So instead, engineers are borrowing the technology from a different kind of construction, bridge building. Even the most powerful tower crane can lift about 20 tons. This thing weighs over 360 not an option. So they went with something called a strand jack. And to understand how it works, imagine two hands or clamps holding a rope. One hand locks the rope, the other brings the rope up, grabs the rope, goes back for more, brings up more rope, and so on and so forth. Strand jacks work on simple hydraulics. A bundle of 22 half-inch diameter cables passes through two clamps. The top clamp grips the strands and moves up almost two feet. Then the bottom clamp locks the cables in place while the top moves back down for the next pull up. It takes two enormous strand jacks to lift this segment, one on each tower. Combined, they could lift the Statue of Liberty. It's the first time that this technology has been used to make lifts this heavy from the top of a skyscraper. Tony? Danny. Welcome, Danny. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Tony, where am I standing right now? Well, you're on the, uh, the sky pack. So this is kind of where the action is. This is where the pool is. Yep. Right where we are now is the second swimming pool. We're actually in the pool right now. We're in the pool. This is the view from the pool. Oh my god. 
people will be able to swim out to the edge of the pool. Yep. And, and literally, there'll be no edge, right? It'll be an infinity edge. It'll be an infinity edge looking and out over Singapore. Wow. It's pretty spectacular. That is amazing. And what's making all of this happen is this really just nasty looking beam. That's right. So this enormous frame is supporting the strand sliding units. Now, can we actually head up top to the strand jack? Yeah, we can. Let's go this way. The strand jack sits on a temporary support structure that extends 30 feet out from the side of the tower. So Tony, where we're walking right now, we're actually leaving the skyscraper below us and we're now just, heading out. We've just walked off the edge of the building. Beyond. So we're now standing perched out. There's no more skyscraper below us right now. There's no building below us. It's awkward. It takes almost 30,000 feet of cables to raise the segment, enough to cross the width of Manhattan. And if any of them get tangled, workers cannot lower the piece back down. So one of the most critical jobs on the site falls to the cable manning crew here at the highest point of the sky park. Okay, so I am now standing at the very top of the strand jack. And you know that because right here, this is it. This is the top of the cables. And what we're about to do, every 30 strokes, they stop everything, clamp the lift, and spray some lubricant inside to make sure everything moves real freely. Unfortunately, I'm getting cast with that roll right now, so what do you got, some WD-40 we're doing this with? Look at this guy. Why is this the most low-tech thing in the world? <laughs> okay, so now what we've done is we've taken the collar off, we've lowered the jack down, now we've exposed the cables to give us good access for some good greasing. Okay, Romley, how do you grease it up? Spray and pull out. Put in, spray, spray, pull out. Go in, spray, pull out. Uh, you know, it's sort of humbling to have to climb up to this point, to have that behind you, to have to take a, a spray can like this, stick in, spray, pull out. Stick in, spray, pull out. <laughs> Go in. These guys have to grease these cables once every hour for the entire night to get this segment up the final 500 feet to the very top of the sky park. Coming up, hang on, hang on. A one of a kind solution to fight Singapore's intense sun whoa, whoa, whoa. puts up a fight of its own. I'm gonna pull you right outside of the basket. Singapore is just 14 miles long. And with literally nowhere else to expand, this tiny island is increasing its footprint by actually filling in the sea, creating almost 1,000 acres of land on which to build an entirely new downtown. So tell me something. If I were standing here five years ago, mm -hmm. what would I have seen there? Well, five years ago, you wouldn't see the floating gallery, you wouldn't see the wheel, you wouldn't see Marina Bay Sands, neither would you see the, the financial center. So this is a radically different skyline in just five years' time. Yes. Singapore's evolution involved 30 years of land reclamation, followed by five years of construction, all culminating with the Marina Bay Sands. So five years ago, mm -hmm. this would have been called the old downtown of Singapore. Yep. And now with the Marina Bay Sands completed, this becomes the new downtown. Yes, absolutely. The Marina Bay Sands three hotel towers will offer guests phenomenal views of Singapore's new downtown. But they also had to be a stunning centerpiece for the city's redevelopment. So, to define their curved silhouette, the architect clad the tower facades with 1,900 glass fins, which also perform a key functional role for the building. The western face of the towers gets the most intense afternoon sun, so when the light hits the fins, they actually deflect the sun's rays, casting a shadow that reduces the heat on the hotel rooms by 20%, while still enabling clear views of the bay. But this distinctive design feature is also one of the most difficult to install. I think today is gonna be one of those days where uh, I go and do something that I kind of think I shouldn't do, but in the name of really understanding how it is they build this building, we're gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna take you in a gondola up the side of a building, almost 600 feet 
to install glass fins. And the guys who are gonna help me do it are right here. Terry? Hi, Danny. Good to see you. David, how are you? Danny, good. Not bad. What are we up to, fellas? We're actually going up to the top. Basically, we're going to install the, uh, the last fins to the tower one. And these fins are actually hanging perpendicular from the facade of the building. That's correct. Each fin is 10 feet tall and weighs 400 pounds. They're hung in straight vertical lines, protruding up to four feet from the side of the tower. Because the facade actually curves outward five degrees at the top, there would not be enough clearance for the Sky Park lift to pass by. So 12 fins in the upper corners of each tower were left off until now. So this is it. We are closing up the curtain wall of Tower 1. Yes. Big milestone. Big milestone. All right. Take me over to my maker. Let's do this. OK. No problem. Lead the way. Terry's crew installed the fins from a six-foot-long gondola hanging off the side of the building. OK. We doing? All right. You gotta be kidding me. It's basically the size of a bathtub, swinging from two sets of 650 foot long cables tied to the tower. Show me the safety, please. It's so precarious that I'm gonna be tied to a separate cable in case the main cable fails. Okay, thing is on, this goes up. That's in the case of dying. One beaner, two beaner, three forster, chin strap, pants. I mean, there's really nothing else you need. Just gonna hang some glass to my boy Jay. 600 feet in the air. Right, man? Give me some skin. Buddy? We're gonna be great. Yeah, here we go. The gondola travels at just 0.2 miles per hour. Here I come. Moving along, just moving along. So it'll take me more than a half hour to reach the top. Oh my god. This gondola looks like it was built by the Unabomber. Sometimes I don't really feel like I, I give you exactly what's going on for me right now, so I want to give you just a little taste of what I'm seeing. There is a fantastic view of Singapore. There is Jay, my chatty friend. And there is not a good situation. All right, we're almost near the top, and you can tell because the building is beginning to bend back on itself and get closer to me. Right there, check it out, we're about about 80 feet from the top of the building. And you can see, if you look up, you can actually see the missing glass panel. And as I approach the top of the skyscraper, they're prepping the glass. There she is. Oh, the wind is really moving up here. That looks safe. Hey, fellas! How are you? How are you? Okay. Nice weather, huh? OK, this is something you don't see every day. On the outside of skyscraper, and right here, right now, I am touching the top of the building. We are on top of the skyscraper. All right, who's ready to install some fins? Each fin is a custom-built pane of solid glass. I've got the line. Hang on, hang on. Look. On a calm day, they are extremely difficult to manage. The wind is blowing this thing out. Give me a hand, give me a hand. But on a day with even a light wind, the task is almost impossible. Hang on, hang on. You thought to pull you right outside of the basket. Hang on, hang on, give me some help. But I'm, I'm not kidding. Every time you get like a little gust of wind, I can feel my feet getting cold a little bit. There she is, slowing down. It's basically like a big double laminated glass sail. And if the wind catches it, I mean, it moves. OK, let it come down a little bit more. The fin can swing up to 20 feet while attached to the tower crane. Coming this way? OK. Watch out. Someone help you. Someone help him. Someone help him. That's just too dangerous for the final installation. So the team has to transfer it to a more precise chain block midair. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold that side. Hold that side, please. All right. So this is it. What we're doing right now is essentially taking the load from the crane and transferring it to that chain block. Are we in? Are we in? OK, I think we're set. This is another one of these moments in my life where I say to myself as an architect, did you really need the fins? Did you have to have fins? Building would have been fine, you know? OK, gondola down. Yep, yep. The fins are designed to clip into each other at the bottom. Any day now, Jay. But here, at the very top connection on the highest fin. Oh, boy, this is going to be a nasty one. It gets locked to the building with bolts. OK, Jay, okay. four bolts. Give me your thoughts. One, two, three, 
Four, are we good? Okay. Are we good? Come here. Bring it in. I need some. Give me. Come on. Give it in, babe. I need some. There it is. Okay. That's right. Whew. Four bolts locked in, lined up. We, Jay, are done. Can we go home? Home. Home. That much he understands. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Up next, building one of the longest and highest cantilevers in the world, jutting out more than 200 feet over nothing. Oh my God, that's enormous. Singapore's new sky park is the first of its kind, a steel structure longer than an aircraft carrier on top of three skyscrapers taller than the Seattle Space Needle. And on the northern end, the architect took this innovation one step further, creating the longest cantilevered observation deck in the world. It's the biggest and heaviest section of the sky park, and it hangs out 200 feet over thin air. When it's done, the sky park is going to look to the eye like one 1,100-foot-long continuous element. But the reality is, it's actually made up of two very different structural conditions. Bridges on the one hand, and something called a cantilever on the other. Spanning between towers one and two, and towers two and three, are two bridges, basically acting like tabletops. The force goes from the bridge, transfers into the towers, and down something called shear walls into the foundation. Now, the cantilever is a different story. A cantilever, by definition, is a load supported on only one side. So what you have here is a 218-foot-long span, almost like a diving board, perched out over nothing. Intuitively, that load wants to just twist off the building. So to keep it down, they put not one, but two 700-ton backspans holding down the cantilever. The two backspans weigh as much as a fully loaded freight train but that weight is critical to balancing out the cantilever, which will jut out longer than a 747 from the end of Tower 3. There are 860 tons of structural steel that make up the 218-foot-long enormous cantilever. It is so big that they actually assemble the entire unit here on the ground before sending it all the way up there. The cantilever is just too big to be raised in one single lift. Instead, it's divided into six segments. Once they're 650 feet in the air, crews will have just one shot to fit them together. So before the segments can be lifted, they're assembled on the ground to be sure that each connection will fit perfectly. So these pieces behind me represent the very final pieces of the cantilever to be assembled here on the ground. So once we get this and this bolted onto that massive cantilever, the lifts can begin. So the crane's now sending the shackles up. We're going to go on top of the piece to connect it. The piece we're attaching today is 12 feet tall. Come on, jungle gym style, baby. And it weighs 30 tons, as much as two Mack trucks. The crane will lift it over to the rest of the cantilever using four extra large shackles. So Viram's now tightening up this shackle. So shackle number one, two, three, and four are all connected. The next step is to take the piece that I'm standing on, lift it up, and extend that cantilever another 50 feet. You ready? Knuckles? Knuckles! All right. You ready, Knuckle Man? Knuckle Monster, you got it. Knucks Magoo, come over here for that. Bang! We are ready to go. So what they've done is they've just put a bit of tension in the line, lift the piece just off the ground to make sure the shackles look nice and they know where the center of gravity is. So are we good? Are we ready? Yeah. All right, let's go. She's off. Out of our hands. Now the crane's got her. It's going to swing her all the way around this way. What's really worth noting is as you look at this thing, this massive floating piece of steel, it's not but a small fraction of the entire cantilever that's going up there. Even with one and a half million pounds of steel, this cantilever will still be susceptible to the problem facing all structures, movement. All buildings, all bridges, even all cantilevers have a natural frequency, meaning they move ever so slightly. Now, if the movement of wind 
or the movement of people even, starts to align with that building's movement, it can combine and collaborate and literally shake a building. So when the engineers were designing the cantilever, they had to be concerned with not just how many people stood on the edge, but also how they were moving. This cantilever has been designed to withstand wind and earthquakes, but its most dangerous threat could come at the hands of a DJ. Yeah, it's thousands of tons of structure up there, so you and me jumping about is not going to do very much, but if you get yeah, 100, 200 people all jumping up and down at the same frequency, then it can actually excite the cantilever and you actually start to feel it. Right. It would take hundreds of people dancing to the exact same motion. Yes. Like the Macarena. Yes, that's right. And believe it or not, our, our dynamics engineers have, have iPods with uh, you know, thousands of songs in them no way. that actually have the frequencies of all of these songs. So, you know, once we actually find out what the frequency is, in theory, you can say you can dance the Macarena, but you can't dance the bus stuff or whatever. That can't else. be true. <laughs> is that true. true? Yeah, that's right. So you're telling me that some engineer is doing intense load calculations and solving the fact that this thing can take the electric slide, but it cannot take the achy, breaky heart. <laughs> and they know that in advance, and it's been designed. More or less, yeah, yeah. Imagine the party, like it's, the party's going great, a big wedding, and all of a sudden someone puts on the Macarena and is like, no! Now that the piece has made its way over to the rest of the cantilever, the next major challenge is lining this giant segment up for attachment. So the piece is now literally sitting right on top of my head. And just imagine, on top of this incredible white long piece of steel will soon be a garden, a pool, and a dance party. Slowly guide it down. The thing incredible about lifts like these is that the first 99% happens almost instantly. And now it gets down to the details. Pushing it, pulling it a matter of inches to get all of these holes lined up to get the bolts in and take the load off the crane. Once the piece is in place, the crews have to line up all 1,500 bolt holes. There are so many bolt holes. They'll connect about a third of them here on the ground to make sure everything fits together before liftoff, because there are no second chances once this piece is airborne. So this is how one fits into the next piece right here. You have these two plates on top, and they're sliding over top of the previous cantilever piece. Here it is, it's coming in, it's coming in. Once she's there, we'll put this pin in to lock the piece together so we can release the crane and move on. About two inches. Just about there, just about there. OK. Yeah. You stay head mom. The pin secures this new piece to the rest of the cantilever now. so bolting can begin. Usually I like break a finger and knock some steel off the thing and almost break the hammer most of the time. I knocked the crap out of that thing. Well, as you can see, the piece is in its final location. And now from where I'm standing, I think you can really get what this thing is. An 860 ton, 218 foot long steel diving board that's gonna be perched out over 600 feet in the air. And coming up, a hotel like no other, oh. with a lobby bigger than a cruise ship wrapped in glass. This is probably one of the most spectacular corridors I've ever seen. Right. But first, what is the maximum number of people the Sky Park can safely hold at one time? The answer, after the break. The answer to the trivia question. 3,900 people can safely be on top of the Sky Park but only 900 of them can be on the cantilever. Singapore is the gateway to Southeast Asia. And for the past century, its economy has depended on its location as one of the world's busiest shipping ports. But this city is in the midst of a makeover. When the Marina Bay Sands opens later this year, Singapore will instantly become one of the largest gaming markets in the world, putting it in the same league as Las Vegas, Atlantic City, and Macau. When Macau opened their casinos, they looked to the past for inspiration. You have the Venetian in Las Vegas, you have the Venetian in Macau. 
carbon copy, only bigger. But here in Singapore, countries so focused on image, they didn't want to mimic what came before them, but instead, they're trying to literally reinvent the idea of a hotel casino. The difference comes down to design. The typical casino model involves a giant gaming floor with a flashy attraction out front and a hotel connected in the back. But with the Marina Bay Sands, the architect actually separated the hotel from the casino and relocated the attraction on top in the form of a sky park. From my perspective, when I think of a hotel and a casino, I think of a ginormous casino, a tall hotel in the back, and basically not being able to check in and go to my room without passing a blackjack table or a slot machine. This doesn't follow that model. It does not. Singapore has a very particular vision as to how they want the gaming component to work. What we built here was not something that was casino focused. It was all of this. So the casino is part of something far grander. And key to making that happen is not just building a set of normal, typical expected structures, but instead to do something like that. Correct. This revolutionary design carries over to the hotel towers themselves. To create a hotel lobby like nothing before, the architect actually split each building apart for the bottom floors, creating one long tapered space linking the three separate towers together. The three hotel towers are all connected by one long continuous atrium, and that atrium is covered in glass. This massive nine foot long panels that we're about to take from down here and install right up there. 3,500 individual panels will hang throughout the atrium, transforming this space into one 850 foot long tube of daylight. So Terry, once the scaffolding comes down behind that glass, this whole chamber is gonna be just a wash in light. Yes, that's correct. And these spaces literally link all three hotel towers and let you look from one end of the building all the way down to the far end. That's correct. So this is more than just a kind of connective hallway from one hotel to the next. It's not just a corridor. This is not a corridor. No. And if it is, it's probably one of the most spectacular corridors I've ever seen. Correct. The atrium glass is a key part of the tower design, but it also plays an important functional role in sealing up the building. With hotel guests arriving in just six months, the delicate job of hanging all that glass needs to happen quickly. Now, why is it so important to get the glass on the atrium and button up the facade? The final bit is we actually have to make the building watertight as quickly as possible to enable all the final finishes to commence on the inside. So all the sheetrocking, carpeting, wallpaper, painting, that sort of stuff, can't happen if moisture can still penetrate the building. That's correct, yes. So today we are going to be headed where up there? We're going up to the top and we'll be installing the top piece of the glass. So we have a big task ahead of us. Either Let's way. Go. To finish the atrium on schedule, Terry's team has to install 200 panels a day, about five and every half hour. So here the guys are, they're just getting the glass ready. A task requiring eight international teams Hello, of Hi. glazing specialists. I'm, yeah. I'm Mike. Why? Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So why, you're one of the installers? Yes. And you've been installing glass how long? Over 10 years. My experience is over 10 years. Your experience is over 10 years. Yeah. My experience is almost 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Ah, 10 minutes. So this is going to be a very good team. Yeah. You and me together. Uh-huh. Master and apprentice. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. I am ready. Let's yeah. get there. Let's do this. Yes. Let's hang some glass. Why and Danny? Why? Because they said so. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it, why? We're installing the third highest panel in this section of the atrium, more than 100 Safety feet from the ground. Safety harness? Why, I want you to be safe the whole time. In addition to Y and me, oh. it'll take 10 other workers to install this 550 pound panel. The crew on the ground applies suction cups to the glass and then sends it up on an electric hoist to meet the crew in the air. Here it comes, check it out. And waiting for me, hello my brother! You guys ready to rock and roll with myself and why? Ready? The big team. This is it. This is the Singapore Glass Stallions. All right, here it comes. It's a big piece of glass, huh? Why? Yes. What are we doing? What's the first step? The first step is uh, we need to take off the handle, yeah. So I'll take off that side, you take off that side? Yeah, take off only the handle. Uh, turn, turn on it, yeah, yes. All right, I don't want to drop it, though. Don't want to uh, drop it. Okay. 
The panel is supported by a backup system of smaller suction cups to help guide the piece on its way. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, guys. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's too scary. I'm not gonna do it. Okay, I did it. I did it. I did it. I'll tow And just like the glass fins outside of the towers, we'll finish maneuvering this panel into place with the chain block. Yeah. Okay, okay, guys. Okay, so the chain block has lifted the glass panel to just about the height, as you can see, of the previous panel. So the next step is to push it in and get it locked into place on the brackets. Okay, why? Should we bring her in? Yeah. Our last one. The interior work for the hotel cannot get started until all the atrium glass is hung and the lobby is watertight. Yeah, I'm pushing, I'm pushing, why? Yeah, yeah. So to speed up that process, 20 attachment brackets come pre-installed on the atrium wall frame. They sit horizontally so the glass can slide into place. There we go. Uh, there we go. Yeah, and yeah. then we'll turn them vertically to lock the panel to the building. Do I need the screwdriver? No, you use the power tools. I'm old school, why? Power tools. I'm old school. You make sure all the pressure bar must be tight because the hand, hand power is not standard. You haven't seen my hand power, why? Ah, hand power. <laughs> Tight, yo. Huh? Check it, Wag. You don't trust me, check it. You have a look. That's just good stuff. Yeah, good. Very good. All right, so all four sides are locked into place, and this glass panel is now fully supported by the building. So therefore, why I'm pulling the plug. Suction is coming off. Three, two, one. Okay, okay. All right, very nice. Look at that. Okay. Nice, huh? Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> Why from Malaysia? Yeah. And his team do this 25 times a day. Best partner. And in just six months' time, this entire atrium will be covered in glass and shimmering with natural daylight. Okay. Let's you and me uh -huh. go home. Now go home. And by go home, I mean hang glass <laughs> the rest of the day. Up next. Racing to finish one of the largest paint jobs in the world. We're gonna use a brush. Yeah, brush. This brush. Yeah, this brush. After 30 years, Singapore's ambitious downtown redevelopment is nearly complete. Its crown jewel, the five and a half billion dollar Marina Bay Sands, is due to open in just six months and crews are racing to complete the hotel's complex facade. The glass on the face of the towers is complete, but on the side walls, the concrete remains exposed. So to finish those walls on time, there's another massive job ahead. When you clad the outside of a skyscraper, typically you cover it in maybe some stone veneer, maybe some glass, or maybe some metal paneling. What you don't do is you don't paint it. Right, because if you've ever painted a fence, every couple of years you have to repaint that fence. But here in Singapore, they're so focused on things being clean, so focused on the immaculate maintenance, they're willing to actually paint their buildings. So today, I'm gonna do something that you would never see on an American construction site. I am gonna paint a skyscraper. Crews will have to paint an area about the size of Mount Rushmore. Muti, I'm Danny. This is gonna be one of the single largest paint jobs ever attempted. Yeah, uh, so I got a bucket of paint, and in order to apply the sophisticated skim coat with the technology we're gonna use, we need a paintbrush. Really, Muti? Yeah, this brush. It's a small brush, yeah? Yeah, small brush, the one small brush. Right, and obviously, you couldn't do a skyscraper with that little brush, that'd be crazy. So instead, <laughs> I have a roller, which ought to, which ought to really expedite the process. Can me fast? All right, well, what more do you need? Budi, yeah. away we go. Okay. This wall faces the country's main highway, connecting the airport to downtown. So, Muji, you're okay? Heights, no problem. No problem, no problem. No problem. No problem. And on opening day, with all eyes on Singapore, it's got to look good. Yeah, okay, so welcome to House Painting 101, skyscraper edition. So we're about uh, 200 or so feet in the air. We've reached our cruising altitude in a super, super robust and technologically sophisticated gondola system. And what we have to do is fix this, is that this wall is a mess, right? Little holes they patched and filled. We have to have one smooth surface 
ready to be seen by all of Singapore. Muti, start with the dark gray first, huh? OK, first. I'm going to paint within the lines here. The dark gray lines mark each floor of the tower, so you can still see the floor-to-floor -floor separation from afar, giving a sense of scale to this massive surface. OK, so now that the gray line has been deepened and darkened, we're going to start painting the, uh, painting the building. So Moody, just uh, yeah, no less, yes. go to it, huh? All right. Nice and gray. I like that Moody's looking over like I'm touching at the top of the Sistine Chapel or something. In total, Moody and the rest of the crew will use more than 2,200 gallons of paint. Moody, how's it look? Does it look good? Yeah, very nice, very nice. Cool. Very nice. Very nice. Moody's loving it. To cover all the tower shear walls in time for opening day. And this project cannot afford delays. Because every month the casino is not open, developers give up $100 million in lost revenue. So these crews have been running at top speed since day one. So John, just to put this in perspective for someone who's not used to seeing a project this size, it would take perhaps another country, a project this big, this expensive, this complex, as much as six plus years to build. Yep. And you guys are on target to complete this in three years, yep. half the time. Yep. And one of the critical aspects of this project at the moment is getting that sky park structure up. So getting the superstructure of that sky park done is key to kind of closing up this project and yep. finishing this race. Yep. But this is going to be a sprint to the finish because crews up at the top of the Sky Park have only six months left to turn this mess of steel into the world's longest elevated pool deck. This is it. This will be the pool deck, and that will be the pool. But there's a problem. I mean, there's a pretty big problem. You go on vacation, you come to the Sky Park, you see this amazing view of Singapore, and then you fall through a hole to your death. It's not good. Not good fun on the vacation. So Wilson and I are going to cover it with this aluminum decking. Cover the holes. Again. Let's cover the holes, my friend. We're filling in the bridge segments between towers one and two, more than 650 feet up. And there is literally nothing below us but the decking we're about to lay. Oh, oh, I just got that thing. That thing, I just, <laughs> I just looked down and I saw a car and it was so little. And my body was like, wait a minute, what are you doing up there? All right, Wilson, how do we begin? Step one? Yeah, step one. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. Okay. And slow in. Yep. Pull back. Pull back. OK. Good. Put the clip. Put the clip on. Nice. Wilson, well, so next piece. Plugging up the hole. Good God. OK. Let him go. Woo! With these 10 panels in place, another 125 square foot section of this Sky Park deck is complete. Last piece, huh? Three. Wilson and the rest of the crew will have to lay down 300 panels a day. Wilson, victory! In order to have the entire Sky Park ready for opening day. Wilson, yes. when the Sky Park is done, people will be swimming right there. You know that? Dancing on that cantilever. Yes. Having dinner in that restaurant. Yes. But we're not done yet, are we? Yep. Come back in six months, check out this sky park. Me and Wilson will be having a cocktail and enjoying this ridiculous, incredible view. You're buying though, right? Yeah, got it. All right, cool. Wilson's buying, so it's all good. When the sky park is complete and the Marina Bay Sands opens, Singapore will join the ranks of the world's top gaming destinations and fulfill a three-decade-long quest to reinvent a nation. You know, for me, the moment when a building actually becomes a piece of architecture is when it transcends its function. So what I mean is, think of the Empire State Building. It's not just about the people who work inside of it, but it's really about the spirit of New York City. The Marina Bay Sands is a project with a hotel and a convention center and a casino. But in reality, the sum is greater than the individual parts. This is a project where an architect, an engineer, an owner, and a government have all come together to literally try and reinvent the face of a nation. And I think if you come back here in about a year's time, that postcard picture you take of Singapore is going to look a lot like that.